41-year-old Helen Clausen was murdered in her Elkhart, Indiana home. Her 11-year-old daughter found her lying in a hallway after coming home from school. Helen had been beaten, raped, strangled, and shot four times. Her case remains unsolved. On Friday, March 14, 1969, 11-year-old Susie Clausen arrived home from school and walked into her Elkhart, Indiana home to find her mother, 41-year-old Helen Clausen, laying in a pool of blood. Susie ran to a neighbor's house, who called police. Police entered the home and discovered Helen's body lying in a blood-soaked hallway of the ranch-style house that she shared with her four daughters, Ruth, 16, Frida, 14, Bess, 13, and Susie, 11, and her husband, Dr. Otto Clausen. An autopsy revealed that Helen had been beaten, raped, strangled with fabric from her sewing room, and shot four times. It was determined a 38 caliber gun or revolver was used to shoot Helen who was shot once in the leg, once in a rib, and twice in the chest. The coroner estimated that Helen had been killed sometime around noon that day, before being discovered by Susie at 4 p.m. Investigators believe Helen was attacked in her sewing room, then either attempted to crawl out of the room to escape, or was dragged down the hall by her killer. The house was not ransacked and nothing appeared to have been stolen. Helen's husband, Dr. Otto Clausen, who was attending a medical conference in Ohio, rushed home after he was informed by telephone that his wife had been murdered. He completely cooperated with police, and was never considered a suspect. Helen had no enemies that anyone was aware of. She was a stay-at-home mom and homemaker. Helen frequently did volunteer work around town. Her father and brother were preachers in different towns and Helen sang in the local church choir. Both Helen and Otto were well-respected members of the community, but unlike Helen, Otto had made some enemies over the years. Otto was the medical director of the Oakland Psychiatric Center in Elkhart. He was very involved in the civil rights movement and even invited civil rights activist Medgar Evers to speak at the hospital. He would also often offer his services free of charge to African-American patients, even visiting them at home when they couldn't come to him. This angered a local chapter of the extremist group known as the John Birch Society, as well as members of the KKK that still resided in the area. On multiple occasions members of the groups would call and threaten Otto, as well as his staff, saying they would kill them and their families. Otto also discovered at one point his phone was tapped. Instead of focusing on the theory that one of the racist groups had been involved in Helen's death, the police focused their investigation on past and current patients of Otto's. A 23-year-old man, named Jerry Falk, was brought in for questioning after it was learned that only days prior he had had a verbal altercation with staff at the hospital. He demanded to speak to his psychiatrist, Otto, but Otto was with other patients. He left in a rage. After being questioned by police, Jerry was readmitted to the mental health facility, but police say it was because he was showing signs of insanity, not because they believe he had anything to do with Helen's murder. Two other patients of Otto's were questioned, but police couldn't find any evidence they had been involved. Police turned to the public for help and received dozens of tips, none of which ever seemed to play out. Then in 1998, after many letters from Susie and the help of an Indiana senator, evidence from Helen's case was submitted to the FBI for further testing. Unfortunately nothing further was learned from the tests. Helen's case remains unsolved. What happened to Trevlin Evans from Shingoshen, Wales? This is a case I've heard about on multiple occasions, and it's a fairly small case, but an unresolved mystery nonetheless. On June 16, 1990 at about 12.40 p.m., Trevlin Evans left her antiques shop in Shingoshen, Wales. She was seen writing a note stating that she would be back in two minutes. The last known sightings of her were at around 1 p.m. where she bought some fruit, an apple and a banana, from a shop on High Street, with her last known sighting being at 2.30 p.m. near her home on Market Street. Her car remained parked outside the antique shop. There were two speculated sightings afterward, one at 2.35 p.m. where a woman was seen walking out of town and another at 3.45 p.m. where a woman was seen walking from Park Avenue toward the river. Those that saw her claimed she seemed happy and relaxed and that she had made plans to go out the evening. It is also speculated that she may have returned to the shop because a banana skin was found in the bin. Along with that, her handbag, car keys, some flowers and fruit were also left in the shop. She was, at the time, married to a Richard Evans, who was supposedly away at the time, renovating their holiday bungalow near Rutland. She had spent a couple of days there that week, but had later returned to Shingoshen. Several searches were conducted after her disappearance where they looked at the nearby canal, mine shafts and caves, but nothing was found. 
there is a claim that a man in a blazer was seen in her company, which was drawn up and circulated during the initial investigations in 1990. This was eventually dismissed as no longer accurate. The case eventually reopened in 2001, in the hopes that new forensic techniques could help unearth fresh evidence. Her husband was arrested at the time of the investigation being reopened, but later released without charge. It was also investigated about if there was a relation with the serial killer Robin Lingus, who had killed three men, one of which was an antiques dealer, just 30 miles away. However, this was ruled out. She was survived by her husband, who died in 2015, and her son, who died in 1999. Since then, no other evidence has been found of what happened to her. No money has left her bank account, and all other claimed sightings have been debunked. So what happened to Trevlin? Was she abducted or murdered? Who could be behind her disappearance, if anyone? In early April 1989, two young Swedish tourists who had been backpacking their way around New Zealand walked into the bush on the Coromandel Peninsula and never walked out. Heidi and Urban. Their names were Heidi Pakunen, 21, and Eubin Hoglin, 23. They had left Stockholm in September 1988 with plans to travel to Australia and then New Zealand. They intended to return to Sweden in May 1989. After a stint in Australia, they arrived in Auckland on 5 December 1988. Urban was a keen outdoorsman, with interests in tramping, hiking, and fishing. He and Heidi purchased a 1976 Subaru wagon with bull bars on the front, and made their way south, interspersing the standard tourist stops of Punakaiki, Fox Glacier, and Queenstown with tramping forays into the New Zealand bush. These were not casual walks or even day trips. Heidi rode home that one tramp took them five days to complete and they covered 85 kilometers, enduring changeable weather and carrying their gear in heavy framed packs. By April 1989, the couple, they were engaged, had made their way north again and were exploring the Coromandel. The Coromandel Peninsula is on the east coast of the North Island, south of Auckland. It features pristine beaches and heavily forested hill country that is both steep and rugged. The pair stopped in Thames, one of the larger townships on the peninsula to get haircuts on the 7th of April. The hairdresser remembered them specifically because of Urban's height, she couldn't lower the chair far enough and had to ask him to slouch down in the chair, and Heidi's looks and long blonde hair. That is the last confirmed sighting of Heidi and Urban. Missing. Heidi and Urban were expected home in Sweden on the 7th of May 1989. When they didn't arrive, family presumed that their plans had changed and the alarm was not immediately raised. Then, on Friday 26th of May, 1989, the NZ Herald ran a story on the front page that said a car belonging to a missing Swedish couple has been abandoned in Mount Eden, Auckland, for six weeks. The discovery worries Auckland police who were contacted by Interpol officers on Wednesday after a request from relatives. The car had been parked in a Mount Eden street since the 14th of April, a week after Heidi and Urban had last been seen. The police set up a special task force named Operation Stockholm, led by Detective Inspector John Hughes. A tip called in by a Coromandel local who had seen the extensive media coverage led the police to Tararu Creek Road, a few kilometers north of Thames. In mid-April local farmer had found a name tag on a fence, as if it had been ripped from an item of clothing. The name, Heidi Pakunan, had meant nothing to him at the time, but now Heidi's name was all over the news. The farmer returned to the location he had found the name tag, and after a brief search he located discarded clothing, male and female. The farmer reported his find and by 28 May, a large group of police and search and rescue volunteers began an exhaustive search of the area, focusing on a location known as Crosby's Clearing, a bush clearing 7 kilometers up a steep track that started at the top of Tarara Creek Road. The search was intense and carried out by experienced personnel, but turned up nothing of interest. Even so, the next day D.I. Hughes announced to the media that the disappearance was now a homicide inquiry. Police investigated how the car belonging to Heidi and Urban had ended up in Auckland. They found that the Subaru had been seen by a local parked on the side of Tararu Creek Road on the 9th of April. The car had a for sale sign in the back, it is common practice for tourists to sell off their vehicles at the end of their trip, and Heidi and Urban were in the last weeks of their time in New Zealand, so this makes sense, and the man had pulled over to check the vehicle out. He said he was surprised to find the vehicle full of belongings, including a camera, camera case and backpacks in obvious view. Did Heidi and Urban head into the bush without their gear? Another group of tourists, also from Sweden, recalled the vehicle well. They had traveled in it, having accepted a ride from a man they had met at a local backpacker's lodge on the 9th or 10th of April. The man driving the car had given them the name Pat Kelly. He had offered to take them to Auckland, 
since he was going that way. These tourists recalled that the car carried no luggage, but that was a telescopic fishing rod in the back. Pat Kelly, the police found, had provided an Auckland phone number when he checked into the lodge. Following this lead, police found that the address to which the phone number belonged had no association with anyone called Pat Kelly, but the most recent tenant had been someone called David Dammy here. The police knew exactly where to find David Dammy here. He was in prison. Dammy here. Dammy here was not a good guy by anyone's standards. In 1972, at the age of 19, he had killed a woman by hitting, he claims accidentally, in the head with an air rifle. The court must have agreed that he did not have murderous intent, as he served two years for manslaughter. Then, in 1985 and 1986, he committed two home invasion rapes. He was apprehended and confessed, saying he had spent the last several years not being sober, but while on bail he decided he couldn't face returning to prison and went on the run. An accomplished outdoorsman, he spent the next three years hiding out in the Coromandel area until he was spotted back in Auckland, on the 24th of May 1989 and arrested for jumping bail on his previous charges. Dami here had family in Auckland, a de facto partner and two sons. D.I. Hughes went to interview the partner and observed, while at her house, a jacket he recognized from pictures as belonging to Urban Hoglan. Tammy Heer's partner reported that Tammy Heer had brought the jacket home and given it to one of his sons. Tammy Heer was interviewed in prison. He admitted to stealing the Subaru and to pawning off the backpacks and gear. He said he had stolen the car from Tararu Creek Road and pawned off the gear in Auckland. Remember the tourists he drove to Auckland said there was luggage in the car other than the fishing pole, Tammy Heer insisted that he had never laid eyes on Heidi and Urban. Eyewitness? Early in the investigation, a search and rescue official had made a statement to Hughes. He had said that he and a friend of his had been tramping in the Crosby's clearing area on the 8th of April and had come across a couple at a campsite. The man had been setting up a blue tent, and seemed familiar with the area as they had discussed local trails, and the search and rescue official described him as being in his early 30s, part Maori, strong build, outdoors type, clean shaven but possibly with a mustache, which, as it turns out, is a fair description of Tammy here. Though I will note there is no maybe about the mustache, Dammy here was at the time sporting an impressive horseshoe style mustache that would have been impossible to miss. The woman with the man in the clearing was described as blonde, European, mid to late 20, and well groomed enough that she seemed out of place in the bush. The woman did not speak during the encounter. Police made media releases, asking for this couple to come forward. No one ever did. The search and rescue official who made that statement later saw Tammy here at a court hearing not the least prejudicial of surroundings, but okay, and was sure that Tammy here was the man he had seen in that clearing. He could not, though, confirm that the woman with him was Heidi. New evidence? More searches were conducted of the Crosby's Creek area. Again, these searches were exhaustive, intensive and conducted by police and search and rescue volunteers who knew the terrain well. Nothing was found. Until, on the 29th of July, after the official searches had ended, one search and rescue volunteer went up the track to search on his own, and found a blue jacket about three meters off the track. Why had it not been found previously, given the intensive searching? The search and rescue volunteer noted specifically that the jacket had not been crumpled as if it had fallen or been thrown away, but neatly folded. As if placed, perhaps? The jacket was confirmed to be Heidi's. Further searching in the area turned up a wallet, presumed to be Heidi's, but nothing else. In December 1989, a Coromanda local exploring an old barn on the Tararu Creek Road found a tent with a manufacturer's label saying it had been made in Sweden. The tent appeared at some point to have been cut open with a knife. Interestingly, the police had searched this barn in June 1989 and had not located the tent, and Tammy here had been in custody since May, so if anyone moved the tent at a later date, it wasn't him. Secret Snitches Tammy here was charged with the murder of Heidi and Urban. The case went to trail in October 1990. Along with Tammy Heer's established connection to the car the Swedes had been driving, and the identification of Tammy Heer as the man in the clearing with the blonde woman, the police pointed to the fact that Tammy Heer had given his son a jacket, binoculars and a watch that belonged to Urban. But that didn't prove Tammy Heer had killed the missing tourists. The case for that rested on three secret witnesses. Because we all know how reliable jailhouse testimony can be, right? But the police came forward with secret witnesses A, B, and C. Secret witness had testified that Tammy here had confessed to him while they were in adjoining cells in Mount Eden prison in Auckland that he had raped and killed both Heidi and Urban, and that he had had to kill them because he couldn't take the risk of being identified and the resultant shame of being locked up for fucking a bloke. 
This confession, if true, was made within 24 hours of Tamihir being charged with the theft of the Subaru, and to a man with whom Tamihir seems to have had no prior connection. This confession also indicates, according to Secret Witness A, that Tamihir did not act alone and that he was with his mates when he encountered Heidi and Urban by chance in the bush. It's worth noting the police have never suggested Tamihir was anything but a lone offender, so apparently they believed some of this jailhouse confession, but not others. Secret Witness B said that Tamihir told him they would never find the bodies, because he had dismembered them. Secret Witness C really went to town. Not only did he report that Tamihir had confessed to raping and killing Heidi and Urban, he went to some descriptive lengths about what he had been told. He had killed Urban with a lump of wood to the head. He had strangled Heidi in a tent. He had stolen the tent from a farm shed, and returned it afterwards. Further, Secret Witness C told the court that Tamihir had confided that he had nearly been interrupted by two people who came across him when he had Heidi prisoner and was setting up a tent in a clearing. Sound familiar? Secret Witness C also indicated Tamihir had confessed to stealing a small motorized dinghy and disposing of the bodies at sea. The jury deliberated for two days, and returned a guilty a verdict. A body. On the 10th of October, 1991, pig hunters found skeletal human remains near Wangamata, over 70 kilometers away from the search area at Crosby's Creek, and not 70 easy kilometers, with nice sealed roads, 70 rugged, hard kilometers, over steep terrain and in heavy bush. The remains were identified as Urban Hoglands. He had not been dismembered, and he had not been disposed of at sea. His body appeared to have been dragged to where it was found. Knife marks on the clothing and the bones indicated foul play, Urban had been stabbed multiple times, and his throat had been cut deeply enough to mark the spinal vertebrae. He had been murdered, but not in the place where the police had said it had happened, and not in the way they had said in court, there was no blunt force trauma to the head. To top it off, Urban was wearing the watch that police had insisted Tamihir had given to his son. Hmm. Snitches get $100,000? In August 1995, Secret Witness C swore an affidavit rescinding his statements. He said that police had fed him the information and told him that a sum of money up to $100,000 was available should I decide to give a statement helpful to the police. He also claimed the police indicated they would support his early release at his parole hearing if he did what they wanted. This opened a whole can of worms, and after the affidavit became public knowledge, Secret Witness C attempted to recant again, now saying his original testimony was true. This went back and forward, true not true, for a while, but in August 2017 Secret Witness C was found guilty of perjury for his 1990 testimony. The testimony upon which Tammy here was convicted. Double hmm. Interesting. D.I. John Hughes, while something of a legend in his own era, is not one of New Zealand's squeaky clean police officers. Hughes was involved, albeit at a relatively junior level, in the Arthur Allen Thomas case, in which police were found to have secured a conviction by the planting of material evidence. This was the first major incidence of clear police corruption to make the media in New Zealand, and something of a landmark case. While Hughes was not in charge of that case, he was mentored by those senior officers and made statements supporting their case. In the late 1970s, Hughes perjured himself in court by presenting a statement that he knew to be false. He knew it was false because he had thrown out the official statement because it contained no admission of guilt and had written a new one that better suited the case he wanted to present. Unfortunately for him, the accused had managed to recover the discarded confession and his lawyer presented it in court, exposing the falsified document and Hughes' actions. The judge referred Hughes to the police commissioner, but no action was taken against him. Hughes had a long career with the New Zealand police, and a reputation as a ruthless operator. According to one article I read, he was known in some circles as the gardener because of how much evidence he planted. Hughes, then, was no stranger to manipulating the evidence to help a case on its way. Is that what happened in Tammy Heer's case? Does that explain the sudden appearance of Heidi's jacket in an area that had previously been searched many times? Is that why the tent suddenly appeared in the farm shed? Did Hughes suborn the testimony of secret witness C? Perhaps Hughes was right, and Tammy Heer did do it. Certainly no one else has ever been in the picture for the murders of Heidi and Urban. But can we trust a conviction based on perjured testimony, orchestrated by a man known not to always play by the rules? Epilogue. Dami here was released on life parole in 2010 after serving 20 years and having mounted several appeals. Unlike the other crimes for which he was convicted, he has never admitted to the murders of Heidi and Urban. He maintains he did nothing more than steal the car and pawn the gear, and his story has never changed. In April 2020, 
In light of secret witness C's perjury and the inconsistencies in the Crown case, Justice Minister Andrew Little announced that Tammy Heer's case will be sent back to the Court of Appeal. Heidi's body has never been found. The Coromandel is rugged and was once gold mining country, there are old mine shafts and pits all over. The bush is dense, and once off the tracks a body might lie quietly for decades until stumbled over by a hunter out looking for deer or pigs. Perhaps she'll be found one day. Until then, may she rest under the Southern Cross.